Thoughts. Thank you for being here with us. My name is John Munoz. I'm a senior librarian with the Pima County Public Library, your Pima County Public Library here in Pima County. Today's program is Making It Up. The festival organizers would like to thank Hughes Federal Credit Union, Pepperbiner Homes, and the City of Tucson for sponsoring this location, and Beanie and Joel Hubner and Dr. David and Marcia Davenport for supporting this upcoming discussion. <laughs> Immediately following this session, the authors will be appearing in the autographing, available for autographing books uh, in the sales and signing area, so look for them immediately following right after this program. If you've enjoyed the festival, please consider becoming a friend of the festival. Your tax-deductible donation allows us to offer festival programming free of charge and to support literacy programs in the community. Learn more about Friend of the Festival benefits at the information booths on the mall or at our website. Also, out of respect for the authors and your fellow audience members, please remember to silence your cell phones. This presentation will last 55 minutes, and half of that will consist of questions from the audience, from you. We have this mobile mic, and I'll be going around to get to you when you raise your hand, so feel free to start whenever you like. So if you don't already have a question in mind, consider formulating one. And now, our authors. A New York Times best-selling writer of two popular series, Witchlands, as well as something... <laughs> as well as Something Strange and Deadly. Her newest series, The Luminaries, is a haunting, high-octane contemporary fantasy set in the forests and falls of Hemlock. The author also runs the popular newsletter for writers, Misfits and Dreamers, and her series, Witchlands, is now in development for TV from the Jim Henson Company. Please welcome Susan Denard. Roger that. Yeah, in fact, you know, Susan Dennard is going to be an aunt any minute now. Literally. She's waiting on that call. So uh, we'll, we'll be uh, adjustable, I'm sure. This novelist right next to her and short story writer is the New York Times best-selling author of the Divergent series and the Carve Mark <laughs> duology. That is you, man. Her short stories have appeared in numerous anthologies and collections, and she was also the guest editor of the Best American Science Fiction and Fantasy 2021. Chosen Ones from 2020 was her first work of adult fiction. Arch Conspirator is her latest book. Please welcome Veronica Roth. And lastly, this writer is the winner of the Bram Stoker Locus and British Fantasy Awards and is the author of Survivor Song, A Head Full of Ghosts, Disappearance at Devil's Rock, and several others. His 2018 novel, The Cabin at the End of the World, is now a major motion picture, better known as Knock at the Cabin, starring Dave Bautista as Leonard, a mysterious harbinger of doom. His essays and short fiction have appeared in the LA Times, New York Times, Entertainment Weekly, and numerous year's best anthologies. Please welcome Paul Tremblay. So the theme of this program this afternoon is making it up, in the sense that novelists don't always get their ideas fully formed or from any one place in particular. Their stories evolve over time. They make things up as they go along. Since the creative process has no rules, authors create rules of their own. How do they know how far they can go? Well, I guess I'll start off there with that. How do you know, well, how do you do what you have been doing? That is to say, what is your process? We'll start with Paul Tremblay at the far end. Like, literally, you know, how do you begin and how do you end yeah. your sessions? That's a great question because I, you know, every once in a while I freak out. It's like, I really don't know what the hell I'm doing. <laughs> like, how did this, you know, I've been a high school math teacher for over 25 years. I can't explain to anybody why I started writing novels and stories, but I did. Um, I would say in general, like, I like to imagine myself as a friendly magpie, not doing harm, but like someone who is just continu continually collecting bits and pieces. It could be from other books, it could be from other movies, certainly from like a ton of life, you know, life experience. I steal from my students' lives all the time, uh, sometimes with their permission. You know, and I build my nest, you know, my nest is, you know, the weird things that become novels. So that's, 
for me a, a starting point. Yeah, Veronica. Should we just jump? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Well, hold on. I, I need to. What is the process for you? Um, I feel like it's similar, but uh, like magpie for for questions. You know, um, I I think it's so important as a person and and as a writer to be curious. And so I have a lot of questions about the world and how it works, and I don't just like let the question die. I just will immediately Google it. You know, um, I. I used to be terrified of spiders. This is, I swear it's related. I was terrified of them. I, every time I have a nightmare, it's about like spider infestation, but there were these beautiful orb weaver spiders that were setting up these huge webs on either side of my front door. And when I'd let my dog out in the morning, I would see them and each day they make a new web and they're like reddish looking. They look like crabs and they're huge. I mean, they're big, but harmless spiders. Anyway, I started to get interested in them and their goings on like I was watching some kind of reality show. It was early in the pandemic, so just saying. Um, and then I started to not want to kill all the spiders that were in our house, so now I'm one of those people who catches spiders in cups and moves them. I've always been that person. Yeah, but it's just so interesting that curiosity can make you gentler in spirit and, um, and can like provide a lot of inspiration for writing. I feel like having a lot of questions is a great way to come up with story ideas. So. And Susan, what about you? Do you map out the story from start to finish, or do you just make it up as you go along? The button. I did that the earlier panel. <laughs> there were different microphones in your defense. Okay, thanks. Um, I mean, if you want to see how I write, I, it's all like I, I do this newsletter multiple times a week about writing where I break down what I'm going through and figuring out right, right now in a story and what I've done before and I answer questions from writers about it. Um, because I, and I, I love doing that because in the act of answering people's questions, I am discovering how I do it. I don't know. For me, it is so intuitive, and not everyone is this way. The, the, the great thing about being a writer is that everybody I know does it differently, and we all end up with books at the end, which is pretty cool. Uh, and for me, it, it is very, very intuitive. I have to trust what feels right, where I hear the character's story taking me, whether or not I even hear their voice yet. Are they ready to tell me the story? Uh, and I realize that sounds not very helpful to you, but sorry. Oh, it's my mother. Ah. <laughs> Yay. Yay. If it's a boy, please consider naming him Bill Viner. <laughs> well, that's a good, you know, that leads to a very interesting idea. You know, you're both, both very creative people. How do you maintain your focus on writing when life throws you distractions? Like, <laughs> like, like global pandemics and the persistent threat of global thermal nuclear war. I mean, how do you keep it going when you're, you know, sitting under that sword of Damocles? Paul. <laughs> wow, I'm really bummed out now. Um, That's my mom. Uh, yeah, I think it was just my mom. A false alarm. Oh, uh, So you get a distraction. What does that yeah. do? Does that throw you off? Does that ruin the, the train of thought? Right, yeah, I would say the mom distraction way more than like geopolitical, like <laughs> existential threats like that. Um, I don't know, when I'm working on a novel, I, you know, I tend to like really focus and zone in. And to me, that's sort of the joy of the novel where it becomes like this year, you know, it takes me 12 to 15 months to write something that I'm confident enough to show my editor. Um, and to me, the living in it day to day, even when I'm like not writing it, I'm thinking about it, then that's the fun part is how like the daily intrusions that almost seem like synchronicity come in. Um, one piece of advice that uh, I love or description from, from genius person and writer Kelly Link, you know, especially when I'm in the process of writing a novel, she talks about training your subconscious because uh, so many writers you rely on your subconscious and she compares it to a dog. <laughs> dog people in here, I hope you like that yeah. comparison. Yeah. But she says, you know, imagine like if your dog came, don't be a terrible person. Like if your dog came with a tennis ball and wanted to play with you, you're like, no, not now, not now, not now. You're gonna have a very sad dog and your dog's gonna stop, stop bringing you things to play with you. Your subconscious is very much like that. Like it brings you an idea, you know, you should reward the subconscious. Like, hey, thanks for bringing that. You know, take it down and play with it for a little bit. You know, you don't have to write a novel about like, you know, sentient water bottles uh, or something like that, if that's what your subconscious brings to you. But you acknowledge it, and the more you do that, I've found the more that it'll be there when you really need it. Uh, you know, where you really need it to help you out. Susan, Susan, what about you when these distractions happen? Yeah, your mother called. Now she's texting. No. <laughs> sorry, sorry. <laughs> 
I'll move on to Veronica then. Following up on that last question, the distractions, what do you do? You're uh, in a groove and then all of a sudden, kaplamo. Oh, yeah. I turned it off. Okay, yes. Okay, so I had a, t a daughter two and nine months ago, two years and nine months ago, and that really messed with me. And I mean, mm. in a great way. <laughs> Obviously, I love my daughter. But I was so used to working in uh, the quiet of my house with my dogs, kind of on my own schedule, um, working on this my writing newsletter when I wanted to, she came back to the to the books. Yeah, no, you can't do that. And I had a baby at the very beginning of COVID, so I had no help. My family lives very far away, and I was just, yeah. And then my husband was working in an office, and here I am with a baby and a book due, and multiple books due, and I really struggled with that. And I feel like only now, when she's almost three, am I really starting to get to a point where, and, and if you follow my newsletter, my New Year's resolution this year was to be okay with the interruptions. Because me getting frustrated every time my daughter shows up or needs something to subsist and live, um, I can't get mad about the fact that I lost where I was in the story. Um, and in fact, sometimes that interruption allows my subconscious to do cool work so that when I do come back to it and get back into the flow, I'm like, oh, this site is actually better than the one that was there before. So I am just trying to make peace with it Yes, I would love to stay in the zone all the time and hear my characters, um, but I can't. She has to eat or just scream at me a bit, <laughs> you know, toddlers. Um, so it's okay. The book will get done when it gets done, and um, that's that's what I keep telling myself. I'm working on that. Yeah. Veronica, what about you? You're superwoman in a room, and then somebody throws kryptonite in there. What do you what do you do? Well, first of all, I love I love Susan's laugh. It's like the laugh of a desperate parent. <laughs> like, it'll be over one day. Um, anyway, yeah, distractions. Um, I... It's a good question. I had an answer a second ago. <laughs> okay. Um, basically, for me, uh, when I was a kid, being in, like, imaginative worlds and stuff, that was... A refuge for me, not from any particularly bad circumstance around me, but from boredom. I had to go to all my sister's volleyball games. My sister's 6'3", so you can imagine volleyball, very competitive. Um, and uh, yeah, so I had like a lot of boredom to cope with, or you know, I was kind of like a sensitive child, so there were negative emotions to cope with, and I would just like kind of bury myself in imaginative stuff. Um, that's how I dealt with it. And uh, so now I'm trying to reconnect with that lately. It's not that I lost it exactly, but I'm trying to make sure the stories that I want to tell are like places I want to live, like people I want to live with for long periods of time so that working feels like a refuge from stress instead of like a source of stress. Although, of course, when you're writing a book at one point or another, perhaps several points, it will become a stress. That's um, true. That's okay. But in, you know, in the overall sense, I try to, you know, make sure that I am in love with what I'm doing and or that I have ways to like reconnect to what I love about it like as quickly as possible. So I have playlists for each book, I'll listen to those songs and try and remember, you know, what scenes I thought of when I was listening to them and stuff like that. So the more I, uh, the more distracted I get, the, the more I try and focus on being in love with the work that I'm doing. Can I just add too, because I love that and I think we should all do that. Um, one of the, something that really helped me like focus that way after I had my daughter and was trying to get back into this, like how do I do this? Um, Maggie Steve Varder has an amazing writing workshop. It's like 50 bucks on Etsy. I cannot recommend it enough. Um, and she says, before she starts a book, she's always like, how do I want to feel for the next six months? How do I want to feel? And that's the book I'm going to go into. And that was how I decided to write The Luminaries next because I was struggling so hard with my daughter. Technically, there's another book in a different series that was due, but I couldn't do that. I needed to escape and find joy in a new location that wasn't the Witchlands. Sorry if you love the Witchlands, it's coming. Um, and that's what, that was how I made that decision. Like, what do I want to feel? Well, you know what? I want to feel like I'm on a fun CW show, so we're going over here for now. <laughs> Susan brings up a good point. You know, sometimes you've got a challenging bit that you've got to make your way through. What's been the most challenging bit of creative writing that you've had to do in your career and you had to just keep going and you couldn't retreat? We'll start with you, Veronica. Sure. I look like I'm poised to speak, right? Um, I feel like the hardest thing for me was writing uh, under pressure for the Divergent series, to be honest with you. Everything has been easier after that point. So it's not that I didn't enjoy the books, but it was 
like uh, your second book is always hard because it's the first first book you write while you're already being paid for writing, um, presumably, or being paid for writing a book anyway. Um, and so you have to like figure out how to do it all over again, and it's already stressful. And then, of course, like the added stress of something really wonderful happening with the first book, um, which I I also loved, but then was stressed out about. I think that's pretty natural. Um, and so I think just like trying to learn in just real time how to write while you feel like people are watching everything you're doing was very challenging. And since then, like you can kind of artificially create safe spaces for yourself in your own mind. Like if I feel really like I'm being observed, I'll open up like a new Word document. And if it, that still doesn't work, then open like, up like Notepad. Yeah. <laughs> It's just like, this one's the real scratch document. <laughs> no one will ever see this one. So uh, that's a helpful trick yourself kind of thing. <laughs> yeah. Paul, what about you? The most challenging bit of creative writing that you've had to do? Yeah. Had to do. So, I mean, one brief and then one that's totally kind of fun, the story. Like one was like, you know, because I've been a full, full-time math teacher and, you know, and a parent. So in the beginning it was, the challenge was the time management, like trying to find time. You know, because especially in the summers, it was me and the two kids, you know, while Lisa w was working, I was home. Uh, and she would always remind me, you get to stay home <laughs> during the summer. I'm like, sorry, I chose to be a teacher. Anyway, um, but that became like almost like a fun, puzzling challenge for me. So very similar to, to what Veronica was just talking about. After I wrote A Head Full of Ghosts, um, I had a couple of novels come out in 09 and 010 that didn't do well. That, you know, I, the big publisher dropped me. So A Head Full of Ghosts, I was very privileged and lucky to get a second chance. So when I was writing the next book, Disappearance of Devil's Rock, it was less the idea of people watching me, but putting pressure on myself, because I was writing this book, I was like, ah, I don't think this is gonna be as good as A Head Full of Ghosts, like it's not coming as easy, and you always think that, like in, in the glow of memory, every previous book seems like it was easy, <laughs> but it wasn't, it was hard. Um, but in this case, I was really struggling with this book. So I sent an email to my uh, mentor, Stuart Renan, who's a, you know, sweet, sweet person and a genius writer. And I sent this long, like, whiny, cry email, like, this is so hard, I don't think it's as good as the, you know, a head full of ghosts, what am I gonna do? You know, sort of expecting I would get that, you're a good writer, Paul, Pat in the head. I got one line back from Stuart, and he wrote, eh, not everything you write's gonna be great. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I laughed just like you did, it was exactly what I needed to hear. Like, I felt like the weight of my self-pressure just sort of lifts, because it was like, okay, I'm just gonna do the best I can to make this book what it's supposed to be. It has nothing to do with the previous book. It was still hard, but I felt so much better. Mm. Yeah. And yeah, you, Susan, was it your unpopular series that was the hardest yeah, to do? Yeah, that would be it. I mean, I, I was living under this weight of like, no one's gonna read this sequel, but they still wanted me to write it with the expectation they might also still cancel the series, but hey, can you turn it in? Um, and it was so hard. It was hard to tap into a creative space where I, because I did still love these characters in this world. Um, and I'm sorry, you can't buy it now. It is out of print. That's how badly it did. Uh, and so I still loved it though and had to find a way to, to power through and write it. And amazingly, they didn't ever cancel the series. So at least they got published, but now you can't read them. Sorry. Um, I think you can get the ebook. Uh, and then I was lucky enough to get another deal later on after some failures and here we are today. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I, I think that was the hardest in terms of like career, but creatively the hardest I've ever had to do was I had to combine two books into one. And that was the creative challenge of my life, figuring out how to make one of my books that was supposed to be two have all of the same character growth, all of the same plot reveals and twists now in a new shape. Because if you think of two books, right? This, I'm gonna get a little craft nitty gritty here. If you think of two books, it's like this, right? It's shaped like rising action, hit it, we go down, and then the next book would do the same. And now I had to have that happen once. So all the things I thought were gonna do this now had to happen once. So it was like this, how do I make my character grow twice in every scene? How do I make her learn all the same, le these different lessons at the same time? Um, and needless to say, that book took me two years instead of the usual one to write. I also had my baby in the middle of it. Um, and it was so stressful, the weight I put on myself to figure it out. And I'm just gonna tell you guys, when you demand your creativity show up, it's not going to. It, it's going to be a jerk, like my toddler, and be like, now. <laughs> it's really like luring a cat out from under a car. <laughs> 
So, you know, you touched upon it, going from one publisher to another, some of these projects that are just seemingly impossible. How do you balance wanting to be original, wanting to be an artist, with giving the suits what they want? You know, how do you balance that? I'll start with you, Veronica. Why? Because <laughs> I'm going alphabetically. Oh, man. In reverse. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, well, if you've been to my earlier panel, I already talked about this, but um, I I feel like to let go of pressure to be original, that's not like, I just, it's not that like it has no relevance or importance, but I find that the pursuit of it creatively is, is really paralyzing. So the best thing to do, in my opinion, is to let it go and try to be interesting instead, because you can do something that has been done before, ever, all of us do, on account of that's how things work. Um, <laughs> but uh, you can do something that's already been done in your way, um, and it can be interesting, engaging, exciting for people anyway. So, um, you know, we return to the same stories over and over again for a reason, because we're still interested in those things. Um, I feel like it's, of course, I'm peddling this because my, <laughs> my most recent book is an Antigone retelling. Um, <laughs> so, but uh, I, I do think that there's there's validity to it. Like, just stop. If you're a writer and you're like, oh, how do I make this uh, completely unique? Like, nothing that's ever been done before. Like, oh my god. Just stop thinking about that. It's not really going to help you that much. Um, yeah. And the, as for the suits, I don't know. I feel like I accidentally gave <laughs> gave the suits what they wanted and gave myself what I wanted. But probably that won't last forever. We'll see. Paul, so what do you think of the uh, publishing executives? Not that there's anything wrong with them. We really like them a lot. They're great. But how do you give them what they want? I don't, I don't, what, who, who cares what they want? I don't know. <laughs> um, no, I, I, that, that's my answer. Like, honestly, part of the reason why I've kept my writing job, uh, my teaching job, excuse me, for, for so long was it always felt like an economic safety net. Like, if I was going to write some weird books, whether or not they got published or, or a lot of people read, read them, I still have my shitty health insurance, really <laughs> shitty health insurance <laughs> from my school. Um, and honestly, the, the whole... The whole time when I'm writing, the trust is, or I hope my trust is, that, you know, I just believe there are another, there are enough readers who are like me that want to read, you know, want to read the book that I end up producing. Uh, yeah. Hey. <laughs> well, thank you so very much. And we are so very lucky. An editor, scholar, journalist, author of both fiction and nonfiction, writing countless books and articles for frontline publications like The Atlantic, Popular Science, Wired, The New Yorker. The Washington Post, and many others. Most recently, they wrote the novels The Future of Another Timeline, The Terraformers, and Autonomous, which won the Lambda Literary Award. They're also the co-host of the Hugo Award-winning podcast, Our Opinions Are Correct. Please welcome Annalee Newitz. Thanks very much, and my apologies for being late. It really does involve a pocket universe, um, and that, that is what happened. So <laughs> anyway, sorry about that. No Lovely worries at to all. join you. No worries at all, and we're so happy that you're here. Thrilled, really. And we were just getting onto the topic of how do you balance wanting to be original but also give publishing executives what they want? How do you walk that line, not unlike a young Johnny Cash needing to find a G chord. I don't know anything about the guitar. Yeah, um, we have I heard. will say that I have never had the executives weigh in on what my book is. Uh, I don't think they even read my books, to be totally honest. <laughs> There's a lot, but publishers publish a lot of books. I mean, they can't keep up. Uh, and I... I mean, my editor will have thoughts and notes, uh, but it's usually just there to make the story better and stronger. Um, I would say the strongest note I've ever had once was in my first series, which you can't read, ha ha, uh, about the ending. And my editor at the time was like, if you do this, people are gonna be upset. I'm like, who, the four readers I have? Um, and I, I, have any of you ever seen the movie Stranger Than Fiction with yeah. Will Ferrell? Okay, that whole premise, I don't wanna spoil the ending, but. I'm gonna have to, uh, is he could stay alive and it would be an okay story, or he could die and it would be a great story. And um, I have always thought about that, like, well, I can make that choice and it'll be an okay story and maybe more people will be happy. 
but I can make the hard choice for the story. Maybe fewer people will read it and they'll be, you know, someone will be mad, but that will make it a great story. And I'm gonna stick with the great story. And Annalie, your, your opinion, I mean, do you just go straight into it? Don't care what they say? I mean, I think, I mean, I really liked your answer, which is that you you really have to write the story that you want to write. And um, I've been lucky enough that by the time I was picked up by Tor, which publishes my science fiction, they pretty much knew I was a weirdo. Um, it wasn't like a surprise. And I had already written my novel, when, my first novel, Autonomous, when they bought it. So it wasn't like they were like, wait, there's gay robots? I don't know. Um, and I mean, honestly, I have been surprised by how weird I can get um, and still kind of get published and, and have a few people buy my books. Um, I think what I think about more, and, and maybe y'all can speak to this as well, I think more about what my readers say to me than, I mean, my editor gives me fantastic feedback on structure and character development, but when the book is out in the world and I start to hear back from readers, and if I start to see a pattern, like everybody is like, I really hate this one thing, um, that actually makes an impression on me and it makes me think about how might I either well, two things. Either how would I do it differently next time, or yes, I will smush your face into the thing um, again and again, and you will like it eventually. Um, <laughs> so there's really two ways. But I mean, oftentimes, if you do hear the same criticism again and again, I do think that there's a, a grain of truth to it, and I think it's at least worth thinking about. Thank you. I just want to remind all of you that we are halfway through this program. 30 minutes have gone by. Another 30 minutes are going to go by. You're never going to get these guys on the stage again. If you want to ask a question, you better do it soon. And we do have that mic, and I'll go out and find you. In fact, as they're responding to my questions, I'll be scanning the audience. So raise your hand. I want to follow up on the idea of a gay robot. <laughs> Not gay so much, but more of a robot. So we've all been learning about chat GBT, and we've been um, kind of scared about it if you're in the behavioral sciences like me, because it seems like you could just tell it, not now, although I asked it to write a love letter and it did a great job, really better than I could have written. Um, and you know, like in a year and a half from now, we can just say, hey, can you finish up the song of ice and fire? <laughs> Maybe make Jon Snow win, and like Daenerys is his cousin, really, so they can get married. So is that going to be like uh, an existential threat? Speaking of ex existential threats, Paul, who still has a day job. Sure, right. ask the horror writer when you've got science fiction writers here. Um, well, because I tend to be pessimist and afraid of everything, yeah, I do think it's sort of an existential threat to, to story. Um, you know, you would like to think that most readers would be able to detect, you know, this is an AI chatbot sort of produced story, but at the same time, I don't know, I think, you know, there's a lot of readers who just want to know, like, what happens next, what happens next, if we're going to be going on what, you know, Lee was talking about, reader response to my stories anyway, sometimes. <laughs> um, yeah, so I, I honestly, I don't know what the answer is. I, I am fearful of it. Okay. Veronica, what about you? I still have to noodle on this, so okay. do you have thoughts? Yeah. I have many thoughts. Um, I actually have been researching this for a couple of weeks because an upcoming episode of uh, the podcast I do with Charlie Jane Anders um, is about uh, ChatGPT and OpenAI, the company that makes it. Um, you know, there's two things going on. One is that when I hear things like, is this a threat to us as writers? Um, I want to remind people that writers have always been incredibly undervalued in our civilization. We are underpaid, we are knocked around, I mean, not unlike many people. Um, it's not like we're unique in having jobs that can be shitty. Um, and it, but what makes it harder is that this is something, of course, that we love to do and we're still not you know, terrifically valued and paid well. Um, so when I hear people saying, oh, it'll take our jobs, I'm like, what jobs? Like, did we ever have great jobs? It's not like, you know, we're, yeah, we're not dentists, you know, we're, <laughs> we're not orthodontists. I don't know why I'm thinking about teeth a lot. But, um, <laughs> that, but I think the other piece of it that's really interesting and that I hope all of us can go home and think about is that the chat GPT chatbot, which you can chat with online right now, um, was created by this company called OpenAI, which is based in San Francisco. 
And it's a company that actually has in their mission statement a science fiction story about what their product does. And I don't mean to say that they've actually written a story and published it, but their narrative of where ChatGPT is going has to do with an existential threat. They believe that ChatGPT really is the first step towards some kind of artificial general intelligence that will be just like a human being. And that from there, we will be facing basically a Terminator type scenario, the destruction of humanity. And guess who can save us from the Terminator scenario? That's right, open AI. <laughs> they can sell you a product to rescue you from the product that they believe is gonna destroy your life. It's a really weird marketing idea. Like, why would you market your product as something that will destroy everything? Um, and I think it's just because it makes it sound really cool. Um, you know, if it's something that's gonna be an existential threat, well, damn, we better pay attention, and then we better pay a bunch of companies to rescue us. Um, so when I see a company spinning up such obvious fiction about its products, I think it's much more about marketing than it is about an actual threat. Um, and I think it's much more interesting to think about why they want to tell that story rather than to believe in that story. I don't, I don't think it's a particularly good story. It's definitely not real. We are not in the first stages of meeting um, you know, Skynet here. Um, but we are in the first stages of a major marketing hype cycle, mm. which I guarantee you will be hearing about more and more. I feel like it reminds me of the way the weight loss industry works, actually, because they first tell you that you have a, something in particular to be insecure about, some part of your body that you thought was pretty normal, but guess what? It's ugly. Oh. Um, and then they're like, here, you can do this thing, this procedure, this supplement, whatever. So like, first create the problem and then pre present the solution. And like, you know, last week I felt fine about my thighs. I don't know. Like, what? Now I have to feel shame? Like, great. <laughs> Last week I felt fine about my paragraphs, and now, <laughs> exactly. Tactical, great. I just saw our first hand up. I'd like to hand this over to you. You've got a question for the authors. What is your best book? What is doing good? What's the best book? What's doing really good? Your book. Yeah, I guess uh, which one was the one that did really well for you? Like the first one. You know, the inspiration. I, the first book that did well for me uh, was my book, Truth Witch, which I can thank my readers for. Thank you for helping me make that book successful and have a career after almost not. Um, and it's about two best friends in a world where magic is dying and three empires are about to go to war and they may or may not be the chosen pair meant to save everything. <laughs> but I wanna add, to go back to that AI thing, um, well, it's relevant. It's relevant. I swear. I, my, I, I, it's a long series, right? And as I mentioned earlier, I got sidetracked because I had a baby and the last one is not out yet. And it's been a long gap. Um, but I'm not worried that chat GPT is going to write the sequel. I mean, would any of you enjoy that? If you would know I did it and you would know that's not the answer. You would be like, well, that's not what Suze was planning. I don't care what the chat came up with. That's why like, you couldn't write the last Game of Thrones because we would be like, well, that's not what he had in mind, <laughs> which I think is also the show, but. <laughs> <laughs> We've got another question here from the audience. Going to pass this over. Yeah, right down the line. Okay, uh, most, I'm not, yeah, I guess the book that broke through for me was probably my first novel, Autonomous, um, which is pretty funny because I'd been working for 10 years as a science journalist and previously had written um, a book about how humans will survive a mass extinction, which I thought was pretty groovy. I was like, yeah, we're gonna make it, um, you know, in a, in a million years. Um, it'll take a while, but we'll be okay. Um, but yeah, Autonomous um, is the story of a pharmaceutical pirate who gets really sick of working for the greedy pharmaceutical industry and takes off in her submarine to uh, manufacture the drugs that she had been making and uh, hand them out for free to people who need them. And she's being chased down by a robot who has some gender issues and kind of a weird romance. Uh. My most popular book is Divergent, uh, which was my first, which is a weird career trajectory that's very annoying to hear about, frankly, so. Um, <laughs> why don't we just, it's dystopian, society's divided, 
but there's a hero, etc. <laughs> Uh, mine was a head full of ghosts, which came out in 2015. Uh, most popular, but also means the most to me because you know I had mentioned I had a, a, a first attempt with publishing with big publisher Henry Holt in 2009, 2010, and those two books didn't did, didn't do well at all. Not my fault, totally. <laughs> I swear. Um, but that I spent like honestly like a few, almost like four, three, well three years being you know, sad and bitter and feeling sorry for myself and feeling jealous for other writers' successes. Um, and then, you know, I was finally able to get over myself and, and be honest about those feelings. You know, those feelings are always there. Those are human feelings, but I learned to deal with it in a much better, more healthier way. And I don't think it's any coincidence that once I let go of those negative, mind-killing, page-killing things, this head full of ghosts, which is a postmodern, secular riff on The Exorcist, fell into my lap. Uh, almost like fully formed. It was like the writer's dream. And the last thing I would say, it's also my favorite because Stephen King on August 19th, 2015, yes, I have the date memorized, <laughs> tweeted that a head full of ghosts scared the living hell out of me and I'm not easy to scare. Also, <laughs> that's my birthday. Oh. Your birthday, Stephen King. Yeah. Uh, Uncle Steve. He's got a question here from the And Bill Clinton's birthday, in case anyone was wondering. <laughs> so my question as basically just a reader, not a writer, um, one thing I enjoy in fiction is really seeing both both extremes when people put a lot of detail on thought and a uh, really well-created universe, but I also really enjoy when authors kind of leave things open-ended and leave you to fill in those gaps. And so I'm wondering, in each of your books, what um, kind of factors and plays in your decision? How much do you want to lay out for the reader, and how much do you want to give them some ambiguity, and what motivates that for you? Sorry. Well, I love me some ambiguity, if anyone's read some of my books. Um, but, you know, in general, honestly, you know, especially now that I've done, you know, multiple novels, I really try to focus on that novel, what's best for that book. You know, every decision I have to make, whether it's the point of view, past or present tense, am I going to be jumping timelines, you know, uh, first person, third person, you know, everything has to be there for a reason. To the point where, when I'm done with a draft, I might give the wrong reason, but I can explain to somebody why every single sentence is in that book and why it is. You know, some of those reasons are gonna be wrong because the books aren't perfect. But at least from, from my point of view, it just helps me to remind myself, it helps me not get in the way of myself. It's like, this has to be here for the story, this story. Um, my two, this is something I'm thinking about a lot recently. So um, my two most recent books are probably the like smallest in terms of scope. So Poster Girl came out in October and it's a dystopian mystery. Um, and it ha you know it has this like post dystopian society kind of, but I don't talk about what happens outside of that really. And it's not a concern of the story. And then Arch Conspirator, Conspirator is a futuristic Antigone retelling and it's like set in the very distant future where um, like there's one civilization left on earth and what's led to that point is ambiguous and this was very deliberate for me because i felt like um i was really struggling with having to take on like world ending consequences all the time and i wanted to really narrow my focus and make sure that my writing could become tighter and more focused and then i was like once you feel more comfortable doing that maybe you can start expanding to world ending galaxy ending like or not ending but just whatever you know like you can work your way bigger again um and that's just i mean i'm like committed to growing as a writer with each book and for me this was like the exercise that i needed it's just to kind of uh, strengthen that muscle of just making mistakes feel high even though the the world like this the world isn't ending you know the stakes are high for the particular character you're writing about at the time so um, it's been freeing not to have to answer every question uh, but you know I'm sure I'll be back to that eventually um, yeah Annalie what about you when do you hold them when do you fold them <laughs> um, I, so my latest novel is called The Terraformers. It just came out a few few weeks ago, um, and it is a it is literally about building a world. It's about people who are on another planet who are trying to turn it into an Earth like world. And a lot of the characters are non human animals. There's some moose who have a romance. There's a sentient flying train who has a romance with a cat who's an investigative journalist. Um, so there's a lot of different. There's also some. Homo sapiens in there, although everyone kind of regards them with suspicion, um, and as they should, yes. 
And so for me, I think, especially in this book, I had to think a lot about holding myself back from wanting to do the thing of like, let me tell you everything about this world and like, here's the geology and here's the atmosphere and here's how they do all this stuff. That is the most boring thing to read, I think, as a reader. So what I like to do is, as much as possible, stay close to the characters and let you experience the world as they literally walk through it. And so there's a lot of stuff in Terraformers that you'll ne that I thought about that is not in the book. But you see, it's kind of like you get a narrow corridor through the world and the characters notice what they're gonna notice. Like the moose cares about where pine cones are um, because they he likes to eat pine cones. Um, and you know, different characters care about different kinds of ecosystems. And so by the end of the book, you have a fairly good understanding of the world and a little bit of the history but, um, but it's really about, for me, building the world is about building characters. And so um, that, that's where my heart lies and that's how I tend to make those decisions about what to throw away. It's like, if it's, is it relevant to my characters? Then it's in. If it's not, oh well, it's not there. Susan, ambiguity? Uh, so I, on one hand, I think genre can inform this to some extent. So The Witchlands is, very high epic fantasy. So like I go all in on that world building. You know where magic come from, where, how it works. I just got real country. I'm from Georgia, y'all. Um, <laughs> you know how magic works and where it comes from. And like, there's so many cultures and everything and, and it's such a long series. So there's a lot to see and explore. Lots of point of view characters. And the Luminaries is not that. It is contemporary, more paranormal fantasy. And it is a trilogy. It's smaller. It's targeted more at teens, whereas The Witchlands is more adult. And in the end, because the question is, like, there is lots of world building. It's a unique secret society of monster hunters, basically, that are in our world. Um, but how the magic works doesn't matter. All you have to know is that there are monsters. And there is a society built around that. And, like, why? Which, I'm going to tell you, is hard for me. I like figuring that stuff out, but I didn't. I intentionally made the choice when I was writing that, like, it doesn't matter why these nightmares, that's what the monsters are called, spew out of a forest every night. They just do, okay? <laughs> and the story is about my character who's been kicked out of this secret society, and that's what matters. And so, I mean, like Veronica said about scope, uh, the scope is more intimate. It's all happening in one city called her town called Hemlock Falls, and that's all that really matters. Um, and I realize that for some people that's very annoying and they're like, but I need to know. Um, and that's fine. We'll talk about it after, okay? <laughs> I do think you have to think about, sorry, briefly, like what questions your story is raising? Like what type of story is it? Because if you're writing like a really epic, like space opera thing, then you're probably going to need to go to a lot of different places and like demonstrate what other parts of the galaxy look like. But if you're writing about like one person, you know, trying to do one thing at one time, then like it'll necessarily be a little bit more limited in scope. But I, lo I love the hybrids of that because like, did anybody see Space Sweepers? Who saw Space Sweepers? Yeah, it's about basically janitors in space and they're cleaning up what? all of the space. It's a Korean film, you can see it on Netflix, I think. I'm writing it down. And um, Space Sweepers, and they're cleaning up all the space junk in orbit around the planet. So it's a space opera. There are really epic, moments where they're like chasing people through the space junk, I won't give away why, but mostly it's just like janitors cleaning up junk. And it's like such a great way of having a space opera, you know? That's awesome. We've got a question down there on the front. I'm gonna make my way there and pass it to this participant. Okay, I'd like to kind of go back to something that Emily mentioned earlier about taking feedback from fans. And so I know there's gotta be time you're, you're busy with things you've got deadlines you got stresses um how much time do you spend and how much heed do you give to reviews uh and emails and things from fans do you, i mean do you just not pay attention to it because it's discouraging uh how do you deal with that because no matter what, who you are what you do what kind of stuff that you write someone's not going to like it so how do you deal with that you have to keep in mind a lot of people are wrong you know <laughs> like i can see a review i you'll get the same book. Someone will be like, damn it, wild building. And someone else will say, not enough world building. Or the world building was terrible. And someone else will say it was amazing. And so it's like, you have to figure out when it is actually valid feedback that you should listen to. And that is hard. It is very hard. And I think when you're a beginner and if you 
breakout success, like it's a lot of voices coming at you. Um, I was fortunate, I suppose, that no one read my books, so I had no one to listen to. Um, and, it, and I was able to, in some ways, to like figure out exactly what matters most to me, but I struggle with that still. Um, I, I have a very intimate, direct relationship with my fandom, um, and after Witch Shadow came out, one person, one person said they didn't like one thing, and that messed with me, because I felt like I had betrayed them and disappointed them and let them down and it really messed with me. It was also postpartum, but hey. Um, I, I, I really, I had to like step away and that was another reason why I had to work on Luminaries next was because I couldn't separate, are they right? Should I not have done that? One voice, one voice. And so it can be really hard. And I mean, now I can look back and be like, well, of course they weren't right. Like literally everybody else said something else. Um, but it's really hard and I don't have an easy answer. Um, I find, I don't think it's ever happened. This, I'll probably regret saying this later. Let me modify it. Rarely does someone point out something to me that I didn't already know by the time the book came out. You know, it's not like I know all and see all, but like, but you write the book and then it's done for like a long time and then it comes out. So you've had time to kind of mull it over and you know like what isn't working about it and you know what its weak points, like if I don't know, even if I don't know exactly what they 